Good afternoon, everyone. My name is McKenna Sturgeon. I am CML's Training and Marketing Specialist. Thank you very much for joining this discussion about water law brought to you by CML and Water Education Colorado. We've got some great speakers in store, but before we get started, I want to do some housekeeping so that you all get as much from this webinar as possible. To the right of your screen, you should see a panel. This is where you will be able to ask questions. I'll monitor those throughout the presentation and we'll be asking them at the end. Um, if we're not able to get to your question, I'll make sure that we follow up and connect you with the person that can get you that right answer. So another piece of information that you should know, this webinar is being recorded. I'll make the recording and presentation materials available later this week. Please keep an eye out for that follow-up email from me containing a link to all of those materials. Um, and if that doesn't come to you, feel free to reach out and I can get that to you. Um, please feel free to respond to my email with any other questions as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to CML's policy advocate and water expert, Heather Stoffer, to introduce our speakers and get our discussion started. Thank you so much, McKenna. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Heather Stauffer. I'm a legislative and policy advocate here for Colorado Municipal League. As part of my work here, I cover water policy issues for the league. I also had the privilege of working on, on uh, water policy before coming to the league. So uh, water in Colorado is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, Water shapes our communities in such a fundamental way. Um, it's something that is always on the agenda in some form or another for towns and cities across Colorado. Um, and I don't think personally I've ever been to a CML district meeting where water was not um, discussed in some form or the other. It's a fundamental part of running a municipality, um, but unless you're a water lawyer, you may not have had the opportunity to learn about water law. Um, so I'm very, very excited that we were able to partner with Water Education Colorado and our two experts, um, Eric Patyandi, Fort Collins Assistant City Attorney, um, and Susan Ryan of Council with Holland and Hart, who advises on water law. Um, they're going to give us a, an overview of Colorado water law today. Um, I hope that this adds to your understanding of water issues in Colorado. Of course, if you're an elected official or municipal staff, um, and have questions about water policy at the state or the federal level, please reach out to me. Um, it's something that I watch very, very closely and I'm always happy uh, to talk with folks about. So with that, I will kick it over to Caitlin Coleman. Awesome, thank you so much, Heather. I'm Caitlin Coleman. I am here representing Water Education Colorado. I work on our publications and digital resources, which includes our webinars. And we're super excited to be here um, partnering with CML to help present this webinar. If you aren't familiar with WECO, which we call Water Education Colorado, we were formed by the legislature in 2002. Um, it was a horrible drought year and leaders felt that our nonprofit was needed to ensure Coloradans were informed on water issues and equipped to make the decisions that can guide us into a sustainable water future. So for the past 20 years, we've been providing independent, nonpartisan programming and content on water through in-person programs and opportunities like webinars, publications, fact sheets, and other digital resources. I wanted to really quickly call out two of those programs. Um, some of you are familiar with our water fluency program, which was designed for many of you elected officials, municipal and county staff and leaders, community and business leaders and other folks who are interested in gaining water fluency or a better understanding of water management and policy issues. Um, you know, folks who maybe don't have a background in water, but need to know about it so they can make decisions um, and you know, think about water with ease, um, making those decisions with confidence and background knowledge. I also wanted to quickly mention our series of reference guides. Um, they're currently known as our Citizens Guide series, but we're renaming them to Community Guides. There's 10 of them. They cover all different water topics, um, but our very most popular is the Guide to Water Law. Uh, so if you come away today wanting to learn more, Water Education Colorado is a great resource, but the Guide to Water Law is a great place to learn to, you know, quickly look up things about water law and have it at your, you know, on your desk at your hand. Um, so those are on our website. Hard copies are available through our store. Uh, so with that, let's get started. So I'm excited to introduce our speakers. Heather already mentioned them. So first we'll hear from 
Eric Patiandi, a water attorney and Fort Collins assistant city attorney. Um, he'll help us kind of understand some of the laws that municipal leaders often come across and maybe should know a bit more about. And then he'll be followed by Susan Ryan, who works for Holland and Hart. Uh, prior to joining Holland and Hart, Susan served as a water referee for water court in the Colorado River Basin. So she'll share her inside knowledge on water law and water court. Um, so I will pass it over to Eric to get us started. All right, let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Is that working? Um, it looks like your slideshow has not begun yet. Oh, there we go. You're set. Okay, great. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, as I was introduced, oh. Well, my name is uh, Eric Patyandi. I'm an assistant city attorney with the city of Fort Collins. Um, I think that's my more formal title. Um, typically, I'm just known as the in-house water attorney for Fort Collins. Um, I've been here for about eight years. And that's about half of the time I've been practicing water law, which has flown by because time flies when you're having fun. Um, well, I'm really glad everyone's here. I can't think of a better way to spend a beautiful fall lunchtime on a Wednesday than to be sitting in your office looking at Zoom. So, um, and especially when you're gonna get lectured on a niche area of the law by me. So hopefully this will be entertaining and something you'll be able to learn and take something away from. Um, why am I here in particular? Well, the good folks at CML reached out to me. Uh, I gave a similar presentation to this a few years back at the 2018 Attorneys Conference for CML. Um, back then I called it everything municipal attorneys need to know about water law. Um, and at that time, I was asked to summarize kind of all of some issues here. Kind of summarize all of Colorado's water laws in a paper. And just in case anyone's wondering, if someone asks you to do that to sort of summarize the whole area you work in, you should really probably say no because it's quite an undertaking, but I had this ready to go and it came up again and I'm happy to present it here for you. So this is a slightly repackaged version of that, um, but I do think it applies not only to attorneys, but also to municipal um, staff members and elected officials. So I have this presentation here and I also think in the materials you've been provided with a paper that I wrote. Um, it's long and I apologize for that, but quite frankly, it could have been a lot longer. So I tried to keep it pretty short. I tried to make it pretty fun and easy to read relatively given the topic and sort of the detail that was needed. Um, it hasn't been updated since 2018, but there's really been no landmark changes. There's a few things that could probably be updated and I'll hopefully get to that one of these years. Um, and I have given it to several non-attorneys to read and Either they lied to me to be polite or they did read it and said it was something they were able to get through and was helpful. So I hope you can have that somewhere in your files um, if you want to dig deeper in any of these topics I'm going to run through. Um, and one note, you know, in the paper, there is a section on water rights, but I'm going to skip that part of the presentation because Susan is going to talk about that here this afternoon. Um, these are sort of the, just a brief outline of the presentation goals. Um, my goal here is really to give you an overview of kind of the key areas of Colorado's water laws, focusing kind of on key principles and policies. Because, you know, water really permeates every aspect of our lives and including ourselves. We all learned in elementary school that most of ourselves are comprised of water. Um, and really, you know, with something that's so ubiquitous throughout our lives, um, there's different ways of approaching it. And that's kind of what the law does. The law has different areas to sort of look at different aspects or different problems that water presents for ourselves in the world. And, you know, it can be really important to know sort of which area, kind of which water world or which realm of the law you're in. And it can get kind of confusing if you sort of think you're in one area, but you're using terminology from another, or you can get kind of mixed up. Um, an analogy my my older son helped me out with was, you know, 
it can be really confusing if you say that, you know, Darth Vader is going to fight Captain Picard to control Mordor. Or if you're not into that uh, sp analogy, a sports analogy might be that it would be really confusing if you told someone that LeBron James was going to throw a touchdown pass to Tony Hawk to win the World Series. You're kind of mixing different things, even though it's all sports or it's all water. You kind of have these different areas it's helpful to keep straight. The second area is to try to help your understanding of sort of the importance and how interesting these laws are. Um, I think everyone has some idea about the importance but, of this, but it's important to know because really us as, us as stewards of um, municipalities and working for the public, we really have an obligation to understand these things. But also I'm hoping to pique your interest because these are really interesting things and that can sort of help motivate you to be excited to, to learn and more about work in these. And finally, it's really to convince you that you're all capable and eager public servants um, that can get involved and, and participate. I know I occasionally run across people who are really intimidated by all things water and water law, but it's really just, um, you know, it's quite frankly no more intimidating or confusing for me than other areas of the law. Like you should hear people talk about tax law or, you know, any specific niche. Um, so these are definitely things you can approach and you can get involved, um, especially for, you know, attorneys and other experts. One thing we really like is to have an engaged, excited client to work with who's really eager to understand and, and work through these things with us, not just to sort of punt because it's a niche expert area. Um, I kind of like to use this part of the presentation to sort of to ground ourselves for a moment. Um, you know, there's this old saying, I think it's attributed to Colorado's former Senator Aspinall that in the West, when you touch water, you touch everything. And lawyers so often speak in these abstract terms about laws and ideas and constructs and principles and blah, 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 blah. It's really helpful, I think, to remind ourselves about kind of what we're really talking about here and what's at stake. And, um, kind of an ironic statement, water is so much more concrete than, than many things we have to deal with. Um, so this is sort of an aerial shot of a of sort of a fairly common development in a municipality in Colorado. And, you know, you can kind of walk through just briefly to sort of see what all the areas that water, that water touches on. You know, there's treated water service to every house. Um, and behind that treated water service, there's miles and miles of pipes, which are governed by certain legal doctrines. There's taking water out of streams or aquifers, which is governed by other legal doctrines. And there's really this whole legal and physical infrastructure behind that, what is really a magical service that we all take for granted. And then, you know, to bring it even more down to earth, the fact that we can all yell at our kids to please brush their teeth and none of us have to worry about whether water is going to be there and whether it's going to be clean and treated enough for them to tell you they brushed your teeth. The second one um, on the list is their sewer water service basically to every house and building um, in most of Colorado. It's another amazing thing there, um, kind of a magic of modern society that we all take for granted. All that water that we use for cooking that washes over us and all the stuff it contains it disappears and from our lives though municipalities and their partnering districts often have to deal with that again you know to bring it down to real the real world about what it's really all about we're able to give your kids baths and not have to wonder well, what on earth am i going to do with all this water that god knows what washed off my boy Stormwater gutters are another interesting aspect of what um, we deal with in, in the various water laws. Um, you know, stormwater helps move rain and snow melt away from properties and to make sure that helps reduce flooding to, to help avoid injuries or, you know, save people's lives. And again, it, this is infrastructure that's sort of everywhere that we all sort of overlook. There's also stormwater ponds or stormwater basins that help capture this infrastructure that are really everywhere. Stormwater is kind of fascinating in that it's a little bit like the matrix where sort of once you know what to look for, you kind of see it everywhere. 
and they also provide recreational opportunities, um, open space, and things for, for all of us to use. There's the creek itself in this shot, kind of off in the corner. Um, you know, more and more, that's, well, that's obviously the source of all this water, but more and more um, creeks are an excite, uh, something we all care about for recreation and its inherent worth as an environmental resource and places we can go to, you know, rejuvenate ourselves. There's also an irrigation ditch in this shot, which flows through many municipalities, not just on the Front Range, but all over. And that brings with it a whole set of headaches. And again, there's a whole set of legal regimes that apply to this. So, you know, hopefully the idea here is coming across that, you know, water itself is such a broad topic and it manifests itself in so many different ways in our lives and with so many different forms. So through this, you know, the way I've, I've often thought about it is sort of there are these various legal water worlds where the law has addressed different aspects of how water interacts with our lives. Um, when I was beginning as a lawyer, I was trained in what I called water law and what most attorneys call water law. And that's really more the realm that Susan is gonna discuss. Um, and that's always what I called it through private practice and working for the water judge in, in Greeley. Um, but when I started working for the city of Fort Collins, I realized that my clients and the people who work day to day on all these world of issues, for them, water law was a much broader topic than just water rights. I get questions saying, hey, this is a water law issue and it would be about say water rates or hey, it's a water law issue and it's about an easement for a pipe for our treated water system or something. Um, and so that is really kind of the much broader definition that I'm bringing to this presentation is, you know, there's all these different water related laws. And so when someone says, oh, it's a water law issue, that can mean different things to different people. And, you know, in general, um, I'm gonna go with sort of the guidance I've gotten from my clients over the years that water law is a, is a pretty broad, much broader topic than us attorneys often seem to describe it as. Okay. So the, the first kind of realm or area are really about legal rights to divert and use water from streams and aquifers. Um, this is sort of the part of the presentation where I was able to cut off a huge part because Susan's going to do all that for us. Um, but just as sort of a sneak preview, this whole area of the law is really about allocating a scarce and unpredictable resource. And the overall policy goal, at least as I see it, is to create uncertainty. You know, we have these streams in Colorado and rivers that tend to be driven by snowmelt in large part. They have unpredictable flows throughout the year, unpredictable flows from year to year. And people who need to use water, including our citizens and um, or our residents and other folks, irrigation companies, farmers, ranchers, everyone, they, they need certainty. And that's really, in my view, kind of fundamentally what this aspect of the law does is it's trying to create certainty in this resource. And it's primarily a rights allocation system. So how does this apply to municipalities? Well, obviously it's um, if you are tr providing treated water to your citizens, this is really important. Or if you're using water to irrigate parks and open spaces. Meanwhile, if you're a municipality where you're relying on a special district to provide treated water, um, having some understanding of these issues is important so you can sort of understand the challenges your partner government is working with. And um, that is all I have on this area because Susan's gonna go into that in great detail. Another area that um, Kind of the second area is sort of water quality regulation. Um, this area of the law is really all about managing pollutants for health, safety, and more and more the environment and, and wildlife. Um, this applies to municipalities in a number of ways. There's a whole set of water quality regulations about treated water supply. There is water quality regulations regarding 
effluent that's put back into the stream. There's water quality regulations regarding stormwater outfalls from those stormwater basins and gutters and those sorts of things. And then obviously water quality is important if you have uh, recreational assets such as a whitewater park or if you have a lake with a public swim beach, for example. Um, and also if you're building new infrastructure, there's often water quality regulations that apply to those in the first instance. Um, so in this kind of water world, it's really primarily you're dealing with the Colorado Water Quality Control Commission and the division, which is really the main administrative agency. Uh, the commission is sort of the governing board of this group and the division is really more the staff who implement and um, regulate. This is sort of primary an area of law, which is driven by the agency, which is different than and as Susan's going to talk about in the water rights world, where you're dealing a lot more in water court. In this water quality regulation area of the law, also there's a lot of interplay between federal and state law, um, which is important. In the, the main federal laws that apply here, there's a federal Clean Water Act, which I'm sure we've all heard about in the news recently. There's the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, which is more specifically geared to the treated water that's delivered to all of our homes and businesses. Um, there's the Colorado statute, which is the Colorado Water Quality Control Act, um, which in many ways implements some of the terms of those federal statutes. And there are mountains and mountains of very detailed regulations kind of fleshing out what those statutes mean. Um, this is also sort of an area where the federal government and the state government work, work together through, I think, what's often called cooperative federalism. So in many ways, the state of Colorado is sort of implementing the provisions of these federal laws through their regulations that are promulgated by the Colorado Water Quality Control Commission. Um, another important aspect here is that at least in principle, these water quality regulations are not supposed to have any effect on the ability of people to operate their water rights and to use water. Um, generally in the law, in Colorado's water laws, there's sort of the idea of kind of a supremacy, if you will, of, of water rights over water, water quality concerns. So for example, um, if you can imagine a stream where a ditch is diverting, say, the entirety of the water flowing in the stream, and below that there's either a trickle of water or a small amount. That impacts, if nothing else, the quality of the water in this as far as the temperature. Temperature is really a big hot topic these days about water quality. Um, but these water quality regulations are generally limited to, they're not able to say, well, you can't use your water right because it affects water quality and temperature downstream. Likewise, the water quality world and the water quantity world are pretty separated in the law where if you're in water court, which Susan is gonna talk about, you can't say, hey, this guy can't use his water right because it impacts my water quality and I'm gonna to have to treat my effluent. Um, so we, whether it makes sense or not, that's sort of the, the legal system we've inherited. There are of course nuances and gray areas in there. Um, but that's sort of the high level idea that these are sort of separate water quality and water quantity are sort of separate legal worlds. And also the regulations are frequently updated. Um, basically all of the regulations are reviewed periodically by the agencies and there's periodic rulemakings to either change the standards, update them, add additional terms, those sorts of things. This might seem pretty straightforward and obvious, but compared to other areas such as water rights, um, it's pretty different. So with water rights, if you get your water right in water court, as long as you don't go back to water court or change the terms, you can operate under that water right basically forever. You know, um, a great many cities that I'm aware of have water rights that date back um, 100, 150, 100 plus years in some instances, and they're still good and and uh, can be used. 
and they don't get updated unless someone were to go to water court to try to do something. Um, that's not really the case with water quality permits. So if you have a wastewater plant or one of your neighboring districts does, they are periodically going to have to go and apply for a new permit. And typically the trend is stricter and additional terms and conditions on that permit. which is, you know, arguably a good thing long-term for society, but it is a ongoing burden for municipalities to figure out how to meet those new standards and to budget and those sorts of things. The next area of the law to touch on is kind of stormwater drainage. Um, what this area of the law is really all about is sort of managing precipitation runoff and potential changes to runoff patterns. In Colorado, you know, we give, it doesn't rain a lot, but when it does, it tends to be those heavy cloud bursts where it rains a whole lot all at once. So runoff is an issue in that. And also this definitely applies to snow melt, which is probably a more common form of runoff. This applies mainly to municipalities through stormwater utilities. Um, many municipalities have these, including my own. Um, to help manage with these issues and also MS4 permits, which we'll touch on. Um, one other area this applies a lot for municipalities is in development review, because as I'm sure we'd all be aware, it's a lot easier to get stormwater and drainage issues right the first time when you build a property or develop a property, as opposed to trying to do it later after the property has been developed. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of the sort of localized flooding issues you see here and there throughout, you know, including my city at times, though we're working on it, and in other towns I'm aware of, that's those often are the result of older developments, say back in the early 1900s, where they didn't have the sophistication of modeling and understanding how much stormwater flows they were going to have to deal with and what to do with those. And then you get those those challenges. So to getting it right the first time is important. So some of some of the key areas of stormwater drainage, uh, the first one is the preservation of historical runoff patterns. So kind of as a as a bottom line beginning point, you know, the, the historical runoff pattern is generally lawful. So if you're at the top of the hill, and it snows on your property and that water runs off onto properties farther down the hill, the law basically says, yeah, that's fine because that's just sort of the natural historical condition. You really get into ch challenges or legal issues when that person upgrading wants to do something to their property that's going to affect how the water flows down onto other properties. And you can imagine in particular that happens with, say, development. Um, so really the goal of a lot of stormwater management is to manage these changing conditions and kind of preserve the historical pattern, which is easier, easier said in principle than done in fact. Um, sort of the main, one way to sort of think about stormwater is that there's kind of two key aspects. There's sort of a quad, quantity amount and a quality amount. Um, as far as the quantity, uh, you can think about stormwater in that when you have development, there's an increase in the amount of stormwater flowing off a property because you're replacing basically plants that would use some of that water with concrete or asphalt or things that don't use water. And you're also changing the timing of when that water leaves the property because if it fell on an undeveloped property, it would, a lot of it would soak into the ground and then slowly work its way back to the stream through the groundwater. Whereas if it lands on a, say a parking lot, it's gonna flow off immediately. So those are kind of the two biggest conceptual challenges. And then the quality aspect um, is basically that water that in the natural condition lands on undeveloped land is a lot cleaner than water that lands on, say, a shopping center, for obvious reasons. So touching on the quantity aspect again, um, a reference here to a Senate Bill 15212. And basically, as I mentioned, you know, development speeds up runoff. 
and also increases runoff to some degree. And a lot of the goal of stormwater policy is to try to slow that runoff down so you don't have floods of varying degrees. And what's a better way to slow water down than to capture it and store it? Well, the challenge there is that there's downstream water users on those streams who have water rights who are waiting for that water so they can put it in their ditches and irrigate their crops and those sorts of things. So there was sort of this inherent tension. And it's a bit of a long story. Uh, that there's some information out there, but basically through Senate Bill from 2015, called Senate Bill 212 from 2015, the legislature provided some guidance on, well, this is how you can slow stormwater runoff down in these stormwater basins in a way that doesn't adversely affect water rights. It's kind of a grand compromise that generally um, kind of captured the way things had been historically done. And so if, you know, in your development review process, it's important to, to know about that and to, to follow, follow that statute. On the moving back to quality again, as I mentioned, you know, not to go into much detail here, but I know some of you are eating lunch, but human beings are, we're, we're kind of gross creatures, ourselves and our environment. Just look at the parking lot of a shopping center next time on the ground. And if you imagine rain and snow melt come off that parking lot, they're going to collect a lot of that stuff and send it to our streams. So that creates a water quality problem for our streams. Um, and that enters MS4 permits. So MS4 is one of my favorite acronyms in a world of acronyms. It stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems. I guess that's better than MSSSS. But basically, this is, this is a permit issued by the state for municipalities that imposes requirements on the owners of these sorts of stormwater systems for things they have to do to ensure water quality coming off their um, stormwater systems. As you can imagine, it's a difficult thing to manage because stormwater comes off basically every street in your municipality and has a whole bunch of points where it enters back into the natural stream. So it's a it's a really potentially very broad permit with a lot of impacts and again the long-term trend is that these are additional and more strict uh, terms in these permits over time as they periodically get updated the next area um, to touch on is infrastructure and distribution systems which is probably probably one of the most important and least sexy of all these areas of law because no one thinks about infrastructure. You know, that infrastructure that we all rely on, we don't see those pipes in the ground. We, few of us think about the dams and diversions that take water out of the stream to provide all the water that we rely on throughout the year. Um, so it's really kind of invisible, which is unfortunate because these are amazing systems and really important ones. But really what this is all about is how to convey water from its source to its place of use um, or with wastewater from where it's used to where we're going to clean it and put it back in the stream. And of course there's stormwater infrastructure as well which which spreads far and wide. Um, one interesting aspect with infrastructure distribution systems is the interlay with ditch and reservoir company systems. Um, so most municipalities probably own a few shares in these companies. Um, well, let me just say, you know, ditch and reservoir companies, I hope I'm not accidentally volunteering myself or one of my friends, this could be its own seminar by itself. And just by mentioning ditch and reservoir companies, I imagine there's some people in the audience who are right now thinking about their favorite slash least favorite ditch company and their blood pressure is rising. But they're here to stay and you, we have to learn how, how they work and so that we can work with them. Um, so municipalities are often involved in ditch and reservoir company systems as shareholders in those companies so we can get yield from them for our customer, for our, for our citizens and residents. Um, you, city staff members are often board members on these companies, which involves 
interesting challenges where they both work for the municipality and have fiduciary duties to the board. And those two things don't always fully line up. Um, that's when I tend to get a lot more phone calls from my staff members. And you know, uh, the city is also a stakeholder where these ditches and reservoirs pass through municipalities as we're growing because there's really challenging easement issues. You know, for example, many ditches have easements under the law, but how wide they are and specifically where those easements are, uh, that's kind of vague. Um, and it sort of is a fact by fact thing. So that's an interesting aspect that could be its full deep dive all of itself. Municipal delivery systems are a little more straightforward, um, generally because they're newer and there's more specifics about sort of where those pipes are. Um, building them and rebuilding them, you often get into a lot of state and federal permitting. Um, depending on the type of infrastructure you're building, you may have to deal with the Clean Water Act under a 404 permit. Um, again, that can take a long time and could be its own seminar. With the state, depending on the size of your project, you may need to get a state fish and wildlife mitigation plan under um, state law. And increasingly, there's local um, permitting issues, such as you know counties and municipalities now often have 1041 permits, which may make it, um, it's sort of another process you have to go through to get your, some of your permitting done. Um, increasingly, this has been more of an issue that's been in the news recently with some projects. Um, and on the whole, really, you know, getting your system in place, getting through all these permitting processes, working with the ditch companies, that can really dictate your physical system and then in turn how you operate your water rights and operate your system as a whole. So it is really important. Um, and it's not always sort of the afterthought, maybe some of us thought it was historically. Uh, likewise, in the treated water distribution system, um, there's interesting aspects there about sort of who owns which pipes, where does your municipality's responsibility end? Um, you know, I know for Fort Collins, for example, Fort Collins utilities will own the pipes in the street, and then our responsibility ends at the at the meter, the curb stop, and then from then it's a privately owned pipe up into homes or businesses, and oftentimes there's sort of a lack of clarity on where that might be or sometimes the customers of our utilities might not have a full understanding of that and those can provide interesting issues to work through as well and finally gray let's touch on gray water um, for those of you who don't know gray water is basically the idea that you can use water again on a parcel some you take water from certain uh certain fixtures like sinks and then goes through some level of treatment and then it can be used again. Despite this being at a high level, such a common sense, simple thing, it actually raises a number of issues across the realm of things. And it can be a bit challenging. Um, anyone who's interested, Fort Collins recently enacted an ordinance after we worked through our challenges. Um, and a few other municipalities have as well, though it hasn't been quite as broadly accepted or broadly enacted as I think some people hoped when that was first authorized in 2013. Uh, the last area is really recreational access rights. Um, you know, more and more people are valuing the natural world and being able to go to their streams and rivers and be able to use them and want to go under reservoirs to recreate. This totally makes sense. Um, we all love being outside. But again, there's a there's a world of rules and laws behind all that that dictate this realm. Um, and basically, sort of the upshot is, you know, access rights for recreation, whether it be for streams or reservoirs, are sort of a separate set of rights from the other type of rights we're talking about. Just because you have a water right to use water from a reservoir doesn't mean you have the right to paddleboard on it or kayak on it or open it to the public. Um, these can often, especially for reservoirs, these can often get pretty nuanced and difficult because the owner of 
the, uh, the kind of the operator of the reservoir has some say over who gets to use the surface of the reservoir and just owning land adjacent to a reservoir doesn't by implication mean you can use the surface of the reservoir. And I, I, I hate to, to say it, but it, it, it is nuanced, nuanced and really depends on a fact by fact scenario. But that's an important thing to know is mainly that, you know, if you want to be able for yourself or for the public, allow people to use the stream or allow people to go down and go on the surface of a reservoir, that needs to be figured out separate from all these other rights we've talked about. And one last slide um, I've added here is that is there's this new approach, um, it's often called One Water, and it's really about integrated planning and management of water. So, you know, throughout this presentation, I've talked about there's sort of the silo of water rights and water supply. There's sort of the silo of water quality. There's the silo of stormwater. There's the silo of infrastructure. And at least, you know, maybe not in all of your municipalities, but at times there's a tendency for people to sort of stay in their silos and their narrow worlds and sort of not realize the connections between these. But these silos, these you know, different water worlds are really kind of constructs. And there's a new movement called One Water where people want to be able to say, hey, if we're going to do this water supply project, maybe we can fold in recreational access, or can we do this in a way that helps with stormwater management or water quality and trying to have sort of multi-use projects that takes a lot of planning and work on the front end. Um, we've been working on that a little bit here in Fort Collins, and I can tell you it's, it's, it's good work, but it's not particularly easy because anytime you move out of one silo, um, you have people speaking different languages with different priorities and those sorts of things, but I think it is kind of the direction things are going and it's a new developing approach. So let's go is what my 11 year old gleefully shouts whenever he's about to beat me in Mario Kart. Um, and that's what I'm trying to, to transmit here is that, you know, I, I find I'm sort of a water nerd. I find this stuff super interesting for whatever reason. And I hope you guys find it interesting and um, take some of this excitement and go and learn more about your own municipality system and get involved. You know, I think we all benefit, both experts and everyone, from having more people being involved um, to try to be involved in that conversation. And it's particularly helpful when you have some sense of how these different worlds all work and to some degree how they work together. Um, and then I guess we'll have questions perhaps at the end. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Um, we really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and switch over presenter view really quick um, so that we can have our next presentation. And then, yes, questions will come at the end. So, Susan, I am sending it to you. Hi, everyone. Just give me a second. I'm trying to share my PowerPoint. I have learned through doing these presentations that I cannot talk and try to share a screen at the same time. So hopefully I'll get it up here in a second. Perfect. Can you see it? Uh, yes. So I, if you hit that 
play from beginning in your corner, you should be good to go. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks so much. I wanted to start by thanking the Colorado Municipal League and WECO for inviting me to speak today. As Eric mentioned, I'm also a fellow water nerd, so I do really love to talk about water law and water court, and I'm excited to see so many people interested in the topic. So thanks again for having me. I have a taught a version of this presentation that I'm about to give um, to the water fluency course that Caitlin mentioned at the beginning that we co-sponsors every year. But I think it applies here. So my goal today is to give you kind of a really high level under understanding of water law concepts and maybe some fundamental understanding about how water court works. So I would like to start by kind of understanding what we're talking about. And one of the perks of being a water lawyer is you get to spend a lot of time out in the field and looking at maps. Um, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, water is separate from the land, but land is still a really important concept when we think about water law in Colorado. So this is just kind of a graphic map of all the major rivers in Colorado. So you can see, when we're talking about water and we talk about the seven water courts throughout the state, you can kind of start to understand how it breaks down by geography. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but in the center of the state basically, as I'm sure everybody knows, is the continental divide. So that's kind of how we divide the state when we're thinking about water and what water is tributary to where. And it comes becomes really important when we start talking about interstate compacts, which I'll touch on in a few minutes. So in Colorado, there are seven major water basins. The first is the South Platte River, which kind of runs through the Denver metro area. The second is the Arkansas River, which you can see is kind of through the Pueblo. It starts in Buena Vista, Salida, and runs through Pueblo out of the eastern part of the state. The third is the Rio Grande River system, which is where the St. Louis Valley is. The fourth is the Gunnison River system. The fifth is the Colorado River Basin, which is kind of getting a lot of press right now due to the compact issues. The sixth is the Yampa and White, which is in the Steamboat Springs area. And the seventh is the San Juan and Dolores River Basin, which is kind of near the Telluride area. So hopefully that just kind of gives you some framework for our discussion today. So when we talk about Colorado water law, we need to start with the definition of what is a Colorado water right. So in Colorado, the public owns all the water and the, the property right that you get is a right to put a portion of the public public's water resource to a beneficial use. And that's really a key concept as you think about water law. It really turns on what is the beneficial use of water. Sometimes this doctrine is referred to as the Colorado Doctrine, and I think that's because it did actually originate in Colorado in the 1800s when the state was being settled by the miners. So there's a few key elements of a water right. The first is that it is a valuable property right that's not tied to land ownership. So that means you can sever water from the land. They don't have to go together. As I mentioned, it's a right to beneficially use the water. And Colorado water law does recognize that beneficial use of water can be changed over time to encourage the maximum beneficial use of the resource. So Susan, yeah. It looks like your presentation came off um, the oh. presenting. Okay. Thank you, that's perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so as you was saying, beneficial use of water can be changed over time. And I think that's important when we think about water law in the municipal context. Eric touched on perhaps you work for a municipality who owns some shares in a ditch company. So that's a really common change of beneficial use of water that we see as municipalities expand and they need more water for their municipal purposes. They can go to water court to change the use of a water right from irrigation use to municipal use. And that's kind of one of the key concepts of Colorado that we recognize and we really value the ability of the public to be able to change the beneficial use of their water rights. 
And the other key concept when we're talking about Colorado water rights is the priority date of the water rights. So the priority date creates a way to administer and enforce the water right during times of scarcity. And this doctrine is referred to as first in time, first in right. And it, it means just what it sounds. If you're the first person on the river and the first person to put water to a beneficial use, you have the most senior priority of, of water in the system. So that means during times of drought or scarcity of water, you know that you will be able to divert the full amount of your water because you have the most senior priority date. And Eric mentioned this in his presentation too, but really the benefit that I see of the prior appropriation system is that it creates certainty during times of scarcity. So when you're looking at your municipal water rights portfolio, I'm guessing you probably have a variety of different water rights. You probably have some junior priority water rights, some senior priorities, some storage rights, some direct flow rights. And so the idea is that you can kind of build this water rights portfolio that's resilient. So you know if it's a drought year and you know if you're, if you're worried about not having enough water to serve your customers, the idea is that you would know you have enough senior water rights to satisfy that need. And if not, you may need to think about, okay, well, what do we need to do to make sure we can satisfy that need during times of drought? But we only know that because we use the prior appropriation system in Colorado. In Colorado, I think you often hear people talk about Colorado as being a strict prior appropriation system. And that just means that it, it, it's true, it's, it's strict. So when water rights are administered, what the division and state engineer does is really look at the priority date of each water right to know who can divert and when they can divert. So Colorado has a separate water court system. The water courts are responsible for adjudicating water rights and priority dates. And as I just mentioned, the division engineer and the water commissioners are the state water officials who have the responsibility for administering water rights on the ground. So I always think when I'm thinking about water, there's two important questions to ask. First, is the water right legally available? Meaning, can you divert the water on paper? And second, is the water right physically available? Meaning, is there actually water in the stream when you think you want to divert it? And in Colorado, you need both to be able to actually divert water into your system. And so this is just a further breakdown of the prior, prior appropriation system. As I mentioned, kind of shorthand for defining it is first in time, first in right. And kind of key in this concept is that all rights within one river system are relative to one another. So if you were gonna go out on a stream and maybe just in a kind of a fundamental example, dig a small ditch and try to divert some water, if you're doing that now in 2022, you would be impacting someone with a more senior water right, let's say from 1980, because you would be taking water that that downstream more senior user would be entitled to divert. So that's how the whole system is based. Everything's well relative to one another. And the other point I'll make is that location on the river does not matter. That's a question I kind of get frequently. If you're, if you're in the headwaters or upstream, does that mean you can divert whatever you want and the downstream users suffer? And no, that's not how Colorado water law works. You have to go back to the beneficial use of water and the priority date for the water right that you're trying to divert. So in Colorado, when we're talking about an appropriation of water, it's a specific plan to divert, store, or otherwise capture, possess, and control water. And those last three are kind of key concepts that you need to be able to show that you're actually taking this water, you have a way to take it, you have a way to control it, and you actually are putting it to a beneficial use. And that's what the water court looks for when adjudicating water rights. So the water court does not create a water right. The only way to create a water right is by actual beneficial use of the water. What the water court does is confirm the existence of a water right and set some parameters on the water right. So 
I'm sure many of you have looked at a water court decree before. The water court decree defines the source of water, i.e. what river or tributary it comes from, the amount of water that you're entitled to divert, where any diversion points on the stream are, and any other limitations on the water rate. Sometimes you might see a volumetric limit on the water rate, which shows you how much water you can divert over an entire year or during a certain month. There are a few exceptions to the fact that the water court does not create a water rate. Um, the most notable exception is the plan for augmentation, which I'll touch on in a few minutes. So these are just some key water law terms that you may already be familiar with and some definitions that I came up with when you're thinking about these terms. We've already talked about priority date and diversion and beneficial use. Um, and I'm just going to go back to the concept of senior versus junior water rates. And so that, that kind of is the concept of the prior appropriation system. And what a call is, is when you are the holder of what you think is a senior water right, you can place what is referred to as a call on that water rate. So that means you get in touch with your local water commissioner and you tell that commissioner, I think I should be diverting under this senior priority. And the water commissioner will say, yeah, sure. Or he might just, he or she might disagree with you. But assuming the water commissioner thinks you're entitled to divert, that commis commissioner will go out and shut down all the more junior water rights from diverting so that your more senior water right can be satisfied. And the other concept here is what's called a trans mountain diversion. And that's where you see water for example, coming from the Colorado River Basin on the West Slope over the Continental Divide to serve the Denver metro area. That's what we refer, we refer to as a trans mountain diversion, which just basically means that you're permanently removing water from the Colorado River and you're permanently taking over to the South Platte River Basin to provide for needs there. So there are several different types of water rates. The most common types are a direct flow water rate, which is just what it sounds, that you're directly diverting water from a surface, like a river, a stream, a creek. In Colorado, when we talk about groundwater rights, we assume that all groundwater in Colorado, with some exceptions that I'm not going to address today, but in general, all groundwater is assumed to be tributary to surface water. Meaning if you have a well and you're pumping from the well, we basically treat it as if you're diverting from the nearest surface water source. And that again goes back to the interconnectivity of water in Colorado and just how we view it as everything being related to one another. The second rate that you're probably already familiar with is called a storage right. And that means the right to impound water for more than 72 hours in either a lake, a pond, or a reservoir. And usually when we talk about storage rights, we define those in acre feet. And the next water rate um, is called an in-stream flow water right. And those are water rates that can only be appropriated by the Colorado Water Conservation Board which is a state entity whose mission is to preserve natural flows in rivers. I just mentioned that because those are also administered in the priority system. They're kind of a unique type of water right, but they still have an, a priority date and they still are administered in accordance with their priority date. The next one um, that some of you may have dealt with is called a recreational in-channel diversion or a RISID, right, is how we refer to it. Um, and those rights can be held by local governmental entities really for the purpose of recreation on a river. So Golden is a great example where they have the whitewater parks um, running through town. I think there was a series of Supreme Court cases, I'm gonna say in the mid 1990s that kind of first recognized RISIDs as a water right that municipal governments can appropriate for the benefit of their citizens. And then lastly, I'll just touch on this because it's incredibly complicated, but there's another right called a federal reserved right. And those rights can be expressed or implied, but 
those are very unique because they're one of the few water rights that are recognized by federal law rather than state law. And the most common example includes tribal water rights. So that's the idea that the federal government created a reservation for a certain Indian tribe, and maybe they didn't expressly grant that tribe any water, but we kind of assume that they implied a water right for the tribe's use on the reservation. We also see these rights when you're talking about national parks, forests, monuments, anything that is owned or created by the federal government. Okay, and so briefly, I just wanted to mention interstate compacts. Um, I think everybody is probably familiar with the issues going on in the Colorado River Basin right now. I know there's been a lot of press on it lately. Um, and the Colorado River Compact is one example of an interstate compact. So we have interstate compacts when we have rivers that are shared by Colorado and at least one other state. So there's two ways that states can share water. The first is through an interstate compact and interstate compacts are authorized by the United States Constitution and it's really just a mechanism to allow states to come to their own agreement as sovereigns about how they think they should share an interstate river and set their own obligations for sharing that water. Now, federal Congress does approve interstate compacts, but that's really their only authority over it. The states come to the agreement and then the federal government will approve that agreement and then it will become law. The other way to allocate a shared water source between states is through what's called equitable apportionment. And that's kind of when the state cannot agree on how to allocate this water. So the United States Supreme Court has original jurisdiction under that scenario to come in and basically come up with an equitable way to allocate a shared stream system between two states. And, you know, compacts are really important to the state of Colorado. I think Colorado, it's either 11 or 13 compacts that Colorado is involved in. So what that means is that Colorado basically consumes about a third of the water it produces and the rest of the water is obligated to other states through all these interstate compacts agreements. And as I mentioned, the Colorado River Basin one is probably the most famous and the most talked about one, but there are a lot of other compacts that implicate Colorado's water rights. So that's kind of a super quick overview of some key water law concepts. And now I'm gonna to turn to a more um, pointed discussion about water court. So what is water court? So there's seven water divisions in the state of Colorado, as I mentioned at the beginning. And here's just another map showing the location of each division. In each water division, there's one water court per water division. There's one division engineer, which as I mentioned earlier, is kind of the state official who's tasked with the job of administering water on the ground. Each water court has one water judge, usually one water referee, and one water clerk. And so this is just another map that kind of shows all the basins in a little bit greater detail. So there's seven major river basins in Colorado, but each river basin has a variety of different water districts. So if you're looking at the South Platte River Basin, you can see up here, there's kind of a breakdown of the different water districts within the basin. Each water district is assigned a local water commissioner. And that water commissioner is really the person who is out in the field, out on the ground, making sure people are diverting water in accordance with their water court decrees. And if not, bringing actions to make sure that gets done. For example, the water commissioner has authority to shut off wells or to turn off ditch head gates if someone's diverting water when they're not supposed to be doing it. So why would you go to water court? As I mentioned, water courts do not create water rights, but what they do is confirm the existence of a water right. And as you'll recall, a water right can only be created by actual 
beneficial use. But really, without a water court decree, you don't have any way, you don't have any enforcement mechanism for your actual beneficial use of water. So that's the real benefit of going to water court. You get a court to kind of decree what, how you've been using the water, set the parameters of your water right, and give you that all important priority date. So that you know if you have a more senior water right, you know that you can rely on that during times of scarcity. So this is just a little bit more information about the different water court roles. And this, this is the water judge. So the water judge presides over water court trials, just like a normal judge would in any other sort of action. Um, the water judge is also a district court judge. So in most water divisions, the water judge has a full district court docket in addition to having a docket of water cases. The other thing I'll just mention that in water court, all trials are bench trials, meaning the judge only hears the trial. There's no juries in water court. The water referee is usually the first person that you'll encounter when you go to water court. And really, the role of the water referee is to see if a case can be resolved before getting set for trial in front of the water judge. So the water referee is tasked with working with the parties in the case to see if there can be any sort of resolution work worked out. The water referee is also tasked with making this independent legal and factual investigation into the case. And so that means oftentimes the water referee will go out in the field with the division engineer, or, you know, try to figure out what's actually going on before an applicant in water court gets a water decree. And that's kind of a unique judicial role to Colorado. I don't know of any other states that have the water referee system. But again, the idea is that water in Colorado is a public resource. And what the court is decreeing and what people are getting is just a right to use that resource. So we want to be really careful when we think about granting those rights and setting parameters associated with that right. And the water clerk kind of runs the day-to-day -day administration of water courts. I just mentioned this in particular, maybe some of you have heard of the water resume, and that's kind of the monthly newspaper publication for each water division that gives the public notice of all the cases filed in that division within the last month. And that's really your only opportunity to get involved in a case. So if you're working with a water attorney or you might do it on your own, it's really important to look at the resume publication every month so you can see if there's any cases that may impact your water rights and any cases that you might want to be involved in to make sure there's no injury to your existing water rights. And then, as they mentioned, the division engineer's office are the people on the ground who kind of go out and administer the water rights and make sure everything is in compliance with water court decrees and the interstate compacts. So I just want to talk for a minute about examples of water court decrees. Um, and I really want to touch on a plan for augmentation because we haven't talked about that yet. I think most municipalities across the state, I can't even think of an example of a municipality that wouldn't have a plan for augmentation. So it is kind of an important concept to understand. So as I mentioned earlier, there's direct flow water rights and storage water, water rights recognized in Colorado. So it's pretty common for a municipality to have groundwater wells, which we presume are tributary to the surface system. So pumping from wells really allows you to have flexibility to pump during the winter, to pump when your demands are higher, to kind of, you know, base your pumping on the needs of your customers, not really on the water flow in the river. But because wells didn't come along until maybe the 1950s, a lot of groundwater rights have very junior priorities. So if you have a groundwater right for a well, oftentimes your priority is so junior that you would not be able to divert it during most summer situations or during a drought year. So a plan for augmentation was developed by the state legislature in 1969 as a legal mechanism to prevent injury to senior water rights by allowing 
municipalities in particular to continue to divert from their wells out of priority. So the whole idea with a plan for augmentation is that you're diverting from a well, it's connected to the surface water system. And the way I think about it is that as you divert from the well, you kind of create a cone of depletion that looks like this, and it kind of migrates towards the surface system. So once that cone of depletion reaches the surface system, it's going to injure a more senior water right because the river is going to be short that amount of water. So the idea with a plan for augmentation is that you can have a more senior source available to replace that hole that you created in the river from your more junior water right. And so that's kind of the mechanism that physically prevents injury to more senior water rights. And it's a legal way that the water court can recognize your ability to divert water, which would otherwise be too junior to divert. I know it's kind of a, a nuanced concept, but I just wanted to throw it out there because I do think it is really important when you talk about municipal water rights portfolios and municipal water systems. It's kind of important to at least maybe understand the concept of what a plan for augmentation is and how it can work in a municipal system. And the other thing I just wanted to mention briefly was a change in water rate. We talked about that before, but to change the existing use of a water rate, you do have to go to water court and basically get a water court decree that kind of looks at what you wanna change the use to, whether or not you're gonna injure any other water rights by changing the use of water. Oftentimes the water court will set terms and conditions in that decree designed to prevent injury to existing water rights. And again, the most common example we see in the municipal context is a municipality purchasing shares in a ditch company that are already decreed for irrigation use, but the town or the city wants to use those shares in its municipal water system. So then you would need to go to water court and explain to water court how you wanna change the water right, why you think you should change the water right, and what terms and conditions you would propose to make sure more senior water rights are not entered by your change. The key with the change of water rate is that you get to retain the original priority date. So a lot of those ditch company rates have very senior priority dates. So that's a real benefit to changing a ditch company right for a municipal system because you get to the benefit of the senior priority date, even though you've changed it for a different use. And then the last two are conditional water rates and absolute water rates. So a conditional water rate is also pretty common. And what that means is that you have a plan to divert water and put it to an actual beneficial use, but you haven't done it yet. So a conditional water court decree allows you to kind of save your place in the priority system. So let's say today in 2022, you have a plan to build a reservoir and you want to fill it with 100 acre feet of water. And if you have a concrete plan and a plan that makes sense and is reasonable and that you can complete within a certain amount of time, you could file for a water right with a 2022 priority date based on that plan. The reason why we recognize conditional water rates is we do want to encourage people to think about water in the long term. So if you're in a municipality, I think a common planning scenario is 50 to 100 years. So you're thinking about the needs mm -hmm. of your customer base, how you're going to grow over that time. So of course you would need to have some conditional water rates if you're not quite ready to build that reservoir, but you think you'll be ready in 10 years. So that's just um, another important piece of the puzzle that I wanted to mention. And my last slide is just kind of some resources that are out there. I know this is a ton of information and I think I went through it pretty quickly, but you know, WECO does a great job of educating the public on water. Um, and there's a lot, just a lot of resources out there. I think the first one, the Colorado Decision Support System is a state run database that really has a massive amount of information you can pull if you're looking at a certain structure, you can pull a map of the structure, you can pull diversion records, you can pull water court decrees, you can sometimes even link it to land ownerships. There's a ton of information 
on that website. I also put the state water court website there too, um, which also has a lot of court by court information about who to contact, how to file something in the court if you need to. And then the other ones are just, you know, current news. This is a great YouTube video about that whole concept of plans for augmentation and groundwater rights that I mentioned earlier, that's kind of fun to watch. So I think that's all I have. Yeah, that ends my slideshow and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that was great. Um, so I we do have a couple of questions and I am, this is McKenna speaking. I'm going to continue to not show my camera right now so you don't have to all watch me read. Um, but as I ask speakers, um, Heather, Caitlin also, please feel free to chime in if you have answers. This is kind of directed at everyone. So I will go ahead and get started. This should be hopefully an easy one to start us off with. Is um, there an in-depth Colorado water law presentation that anyone would recommend? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, Eric, do you have one that pops to mind? I, I don't really. I mean, I know there's some good books out there. I know Justice Hobbs wrote sort of a summary book that I probably have back on a shelf here. I don't, I'm not, a, nothing that comes to mind as far as presentations, really. Okay, perfect. Hey, this is Caitlin. I, have, I haven't attended this presentation and I don't know for sure how it goes, but um, someone named Aaron Clay, an attorney, does this water law in a nutshell presentation at different venues. He has one coming up October 26th uh, at Fort Lewis College. So if you happen to be down there, I think you could check it out. I don't know if it's online or not. Um, but I think, you know, he does it in other places as well. So that could be another place to learn a bit more. Great, thank you so much. Um, and if we see others, we will absolutely make those available um, by link. So next question asks, the Colorado Water Plan called for the state to adopt land use codes, building codes and zoning regulations that better conserve water and improve water efficiency. Are you seeing the state legislature acting on this policy goal at all? What impact has the Colorado Water Plan had on Colorado water law? Um, well, I'll take a first bite at that, if you don't mind, Susan. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I know there have been several bills in the past couple of years. I don't remember many of the specifics where the legislature has directed local governments to include certain aspects of water in their local land use planning. So my general understanding is, for the most part, a lot of land use planning is left up to local governments. Um, I know for Fort Collins, we've been trying to build in additional aspects of kind of integrating water planning as well as um, water planning into our land use planning on, on the local level. Um, and I think that my general understanding is that's sort of local government by local government. Um, and as far as the, the water plan, I haven't, I don't think I've personally seen a whole lot of direct impact. You know, it's it's generally used as kind of, I've understood it to be generally used as sort of high level policy direction for the state, but a lot of sort of the more meaningful specific changes or certainly spending money really needs to be implemented through the legislature. So that's kind of where the rubber hits the road. On that. And, you know, I would agree with Eric's comments on that. I, I think we do see a lot of changes at the local level when they're talking about building permits and land use planning. Um, but when we talk about water law at the state level, and again, I use the term water law to talk about quantity of water, we haven't seen any changes directly from the Colorado water plan that I'm aware of. Awesome, thank you. So next question, 
are, you, are municipalities and or water providers mandated at any level to contain stormwater drainage? Well, if they, water providers are not, um, you know, in general, no one can capture stormwater drainage for more than 72 hours, basically, without a water right decree. Um, typically, water providers that deliver water to customers, like the various municipal utilities or special districts, they generally operate separately from the stormwater utilities and the entities that manage that. Um, that's certainly the way it happens in Fort Collins. Um, so in our, with our stormwater utility, we operate um, and regulate a whole number of stormwater facilities. But for the most part, I don't think we really have water rights for those and they don't supply our treated water system. Awesome, thank you. So, Next question is for Susan. Um, your presentation said that appropriation is a specific plan to divert. Is that all or does some step need to be taken to actually put it into beneficial use? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is, it's two. It's going back to the actual benefic beneficial use of water. So you need to have a step to divert the water and control and possess the water, but you do always need to have that actual beneficial use at the end. Perfect, thank you so much. So next question asks, on recreational in-channel diversions, do they take precedent to junior and or senior rights? I, let me know if you disagree, Eric, but I would say no, you know, there are, RISIDs are water rights administered in the priority system, just like any other water right. They're a little bit unique in that they're non-consumptive, meaning that you're not pulling water out of the river, putting it to use. It always stays in the river. Um, the most recent RISID decree that I worked on when I was a water referee was one for the city of Glenwood Springs. Um, and they were trying to build a whitewater park in their downtown area right where the Colorado River is. Um, and it's pretty complicated. You know, they have all these tables in the decree with all these different flow scenarios. So they'll say in April, if the Colorado River is flowing at 10 CFS, then our RISID will be one CFS. And I'm just making up numbers for an example, but I think there's some complexity there, but in general, they're administered in the priority system, just like any other water right is. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, you know, Fort Collins has a water, two water rights that are kind of preceded RISIDs, but they're sort of the same concept. And the one rate they are, they have a priority date and all that. The one wrinkle is because they're in the river and non-consumptive, they can sort of be used without, even though there's um, a, a more senior water right call, depending on where they're located. So, for example, if just downstream of your whitewater park where you have your RISID is a really senior ditch that, say, places a call a lot, that's going to pull water through your whitewater park a lot. And whether or not you're really using your water right for your RISID, that's probably something water lawyers could talk about for a long time over some barley sodas. But as the practical matter, you're going to get water through your whitewater park quite a bit. So there's a bit of a nuance there, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right, next question. Which rulings are entered by the referee versus the water court judge? So the referee um, kind of takes the initial crack at almost every case that comes to water court. So the idea is that you get a ruling of the referee and then it gets submitted to the water judge and then the water judge will sign off on it if there's no disagreement with what the referee decided. Now, sometimes when you have a case in front of the referee, particularly if there's a lot of opposition to the case, someone will say, you know, we're not gonna be able to resolve this in front of the referee, so we need to set it for a trial in front of the water judge. So that's really the distinction. If there's such a dispute that it has to go to a formal court trial, then that's something the water judge 
would decide. If it's something that can be resolved with the referee, then it's decided by the referee. But it, there's no distinction in types of water rights or anything like that. And I will, my one caveat is every water division is a little bit different. So it was the water referee in division five, which is the Colorado River Basin. And here in the Colorado River Basin, the idea is that the referee at least initially handles every single case that's filed in water court. In division one, which is where the South Platte River is, that, that's not the practice. There are some cases that are never seen by the referee. Um, like if there's 50 objections to the case, that would be a case in division one that would just go right to the water judge and the water referee doesn't usually hear anything in the case. So there's a little variety throughout the state. Perfect, thank you. So next, can you explain the difference between augmentation and exchange? Is augmentation for out of priority groundwater use while exchange is for out of priority surface water use? That's a great Susan question. handle this one. <laughs> It's hotly debated, debated right now. It's a hot topic in Colorado water law. Um, I think that's generally a correct statement. So a plan for augmentation fundamentally allows you to divert out of priority water by having some sort of replacement water source that prevents injury to other water rights. A lot of times when you're implementing a plan for augmentation, your location of depletion on the river and your location of replacement water very, very rarely line up perfectly. So you need some way to get the replacement water to the hole you're creating in the river. And how we do that is through an exchange. Um, so they work in conjunction with each other. There's kind of been a new way of thinking about it, I think, from the state and division engineer's office in the past few years, where it used to be there was never really a distinction as to whether you're replacing a lag depletion or a surface depletion. You kind of just looked at plans for augmentation and exchanges together. But now the state is making a distinction that if you're replacing a lag depletion, it's done under a plan for augmentation and what they're calling a water exchange project, right? If you're replacing a surface depletion, it's done under what traditionally we think about as an exchange rate. And I should clarify that a traditional exchange rate is an appropriative rate. So when you get a water right for an exchange, you get a priority date for your exchange, meaning that the exchange is administered in the priority system, just like any other water right. Whereas a plan for augmentation is not a water right. Even though it's decreed by the water court, it, it's really that mechanism that allows you to divert your junior water rights and replace them with senior water rights. So when I think of a plan for augmentation, I think of it as kind of like a like a, a mechanism really that you plug in existing water rights to to operate it. It's not a separate water right. Hopefully that made sense. Let me know. I mean, Eric, maybe you want to clarify any of that. Um, those are pretty nuanced concepts. And I think, as I mentioned, thinking about it is evolving as we speak. No, you did a great job. Way better than I would have done. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And then to all of those who have not gotten their questions answered, I'll make sure to send those follow ups as well. Um, so Eric, this one's for you. Could you briefly describe um, 404 and 1041 permits? Yeah, um, so 404 is um, refers to a section of the Clean Water Act where you need to get a permit if you are discharging dredge or fill material into the waters of the United States. Fun fact, when Congress and made that statute, they never really decided what the waters of the United States actually are. And people have been fighting about it ever since, including this very week in front of the United States Supreme Court. So for example, if you're um, wanting to enlarge a reservoir or build a new reservoir or do a great number of things, you might trigger this requirement. Um, for smaller projects, there's categories you can find yourself in where it really is a streamlined permitting process, but for larger projects, you get funneled into a much larger and um, 
more challenging permitting process where they look at your specific project and have to look at alternatives. 1041 refers to um, a state statute that was passed, I should know this, but it was sometime in the 1970s, where they basically allowed local governments like counties and municipalities to enact regulations um, for certain matters that would normally be regulated by the state government. Um, so this has given local city, local counties, and some cities that have enacted these regulations um, pretty significant powers as far as land use planning for large projects. Um, so, for example, if you want to, at least in my county, if you want to enlarge a reservoir, um, or if you want to put in certain pipes, you need to get a 1041 permit from the county. Um, that's in addition to all these additional. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and I will go ahead and wrap us up. So thank you everybody very much for attending today's webinar. Thank you to both of our great speakers as well. I know we had quite a few different questions. So as I said, I will follow up with those. Um, so to wrap us up, I just want to remind everyone that this has been recorded and will be made available later this week, along with all of the materials that have been referenced um, and our presentation materials. So keep an eye out for that email. And if you do have any other questions that come up um, after this, please feel free to reach out. So with that, I thank everyone and I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Have a good one.